school, okay? And uh, we have, uh, with our little lambs and our toddlers and all that, we'll be going down. And we want to, first of all, I want to thank uh, Kristen for taking care of the little ones, you know, the scheduling and all that, and Rachel for the, uh, for the, the older ones. And, you know, you know, and I would just tell you this, you know, circumstances change very quickly, don't they, in life? And you, many times people want us to think that, that maybe the devil wants you to think your circumstances will never change. I'll just kind of tell you how much circumstances change before I let you all go. About a week and a half ago, Blake was out hunting black bear in Maine, and now he's going to be watching young children. Hallelujah. That's how much <laughs> circumstances can change. Hallelujah. So you know what? If you're in a circumstance that doesn't look good, that's okay in life. It'll, it'll change for you, okay? But uh, we're going to dismiss all the kids. They can go to their classes. It's third grade and below, okay? Third grade and below, okay? <clears throat> You know, and I hope you'll all want to, uh, when I come and ask you to pray, I hope you'll all come and do that because it is wonderful to see how these little kids are so receptive. It, it really is in life, okay? And uh, we feel very blessed, okay? Uh, what I would like us to do, we're going to finish up this week on change is natural. Everybody say that with me. Change is natural. And, and as, well, like I said, as I know this, because if I would look in my yearbook, I look a whole lot different, okay? You know that. Uh, and change is always going on in our lives. And we're finding out last week uh, that the method is secondary, the message is primary. And we found out in life that when we get in trouble in life, maybe business-wise, you know, a great example I'll tell you right now is Sears and Roebuck. When I was a kid growing up, there was nothing stronger than Sears. But you know what? They didn't change their methods, Okay, they were still selling the same thing, but they didn't change how they were, were advertising and how they were getting their product out, and now they're struggling in life, okay? We see sometimes churches that were once vibrant in their communities, now they're just a shell with few people there. It's not that their message has changed, but their methods didn't change. And so we see in families too, we're, we're constantly changing in families. It's a whole different ball game raising little kids and raising teenagers, amen? But isn't the message still the same? You want them to grow up, be respectful, love Jesus, and be a light in this world. And so we're realizing we have to constantly be changing the methods, but the message stays the same. And we also said, and I want people to realize this, that does the means always justify the end? No, it doesn't. But we should realize that we can't be married to something too long. And if we are, it could really be detrimental to us, okay? And last week we talked about defeating the armies of of Israel. I'll go over these real quick. We found out one time God told Moses to raise his hands. The next time God told Moses to blow uh, uh, blow the horn, okay? And the next time God used four lepers that walked towards uh, the enemy's camp. In all cases, the enemies of Israel were defeated. Different methods, same message. We found out about last week with Bartimaeus with healing. One way with Bartimaeus, God, uh, Jesus actually put his hands on Bartimaeus. And next time in Acts, it says that Paul had handkerchiefs that they used for healing. And the next time Elijah asked, the, asked Naaman to go and wash in the river. So we found out all of them were healed, but what did God do? He used different methods, okay? And so I just want to talk about those. Now we're going to go into uh, another method on, is is deliverance of, of the New Testament believers. God wants to protect you. And we're just going to go to the book of Acts. And I want us to turn over to Acts chapter 12. And see, the objective is that we need to realize God wants to protect us. How he chooses to do it is up to him. And just because he protects you and I one way, doesn't mean he's always going to do it again that way. Over in Acts chapter 12, and we're going to go in verse 5. The story is here. Herod, he had just brought James, one of the disciples, and he had just, he, he literally, he, he skinned James alive and threw salt on him. And that's how James died. And Herod saw how, how the Jews really liked that. So he grabbed Pete and he told, he said, you know what? I'm going to kill Pete. Okay? So Pete's in prison here in, this, in, in verse 5 and Acts 12. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for, for him by the church. And when Herod was about to bring him out that night, Peter was sleeping bound with two chains between two soldiers and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. 
Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and light shone in the prison, and he struck Peter on the side and raised him up quickly, saying, Arise quickly, and his chains fell off his hands. Then the angel said unto him, Gird yourself and tie up your sandals. So he did. And he said to him, Put on your garments and follow me. So he went out and followed him and did not, and, and did not, uh, and did not know what was done by the angel was real, for he thought he was seeing a vision. So we're finding out here, number one, how is God delivering a New Testament believer? By an angel, okay? And so we need to realize that. Now I want us to go over to Acts chapter 19. Here's another New Testament believer who is in trouble in life. We're going to go in Acts chapter 19. We're going to go down into verse 23. And this is when, uh, this is actually, this is a riot at Ephesus, okay? This is in about that time there arose a great commotion about the way. The way was actually what Christians were called in the New Testament. Before they were called Christians first, the Bible says, at Antioch, they were called the way. Now what did Jesus say in John fourteen six? I am the way and the truth and the life. It says, For there was a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Diana, brought no small profit to the craftsmen. He called them together with the workmen of Samil, uh, with, uh, with workers of uh, similar occupation, and said, Men, you know that we have, uh, we have our prosperity up uh, uh, by this trade. Moreover, you see then here that not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all of Asia, this Paul, am I, am I at the right one I want? Nine. Oh, I'm at 19. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm thinking, okay. Okay, let's go down here. Okay, Paul, uh, and, and chapter 9, verse 23. I thought, he, Paul actually was delivered from Demetrius at Ephesus too. That was another story, okay? Actually there, they drug him out and they beat him up and they were ready to kill him. And then actually the captain came and rescued him, okay? That's not the way I want to be rescued from something, but that's what happened. Here it says in verse 23, the Jews, it says, Now after many days were passed, the Jews blotted to kill him, Paul, or Saul. But their plot became known to Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples, look at then the disciples by, took him by night and led him down through the wall in a large basket. Now, isn't it, now, if you and I are going to be rescued, wouldn't we rather have an angel do it? Come on, wouldn't that be kind of spectacular? I mean, couldn't you come out and think, man, I am somebody. Now, and you're, they're letting you down in the middle of the night in a basket. You kind of think, hey, what about me, okay? But what did God promise? Deliverance. So one thing he did supernaturally, it looks like an angel. Another time, through a basket, okay? Now I want us to go down to uh, uh, Acts 23. Acts 23, okay? And this is about Saul being rescued again. You know, it's amazing. Everybody loves Saul or Paul, but do you know, he got in a lot of trouble. You know that? They wanted to kill him. They beat him up. I mean, read in Corinthians. He was shipwrecked. He was beaten. He was floating in the ocean for days. All these things. So I really don't want to be like Saul that way, okay? But over in Acts chapter 23, and we're going to go down in verse 12. It says, Now, and when it was day, some of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under oath, saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. Now, there were more than 40 who had formed this conspiracy. They came to the chief priests and elders and said, We have bound ourselves under a great oath that we will, not eat, we will eat nothing until we have killed Paul. Now therefore, now, therefore, together with the council, suggest to the commander that he be brought down to you tomorrow as though you are going to make further inquiries concerning him, but we are ready to kill him before he comes near. So when Paul's sister's son heard of their ambush, he went and entered the barracks and told Paul. Then Paul called one of the centurions to him and said, Take this young man to the commander, for he has something to tell them. So he took him and brought him to the commander and said, but, and said Paul the prisoner called me, to, called me to him and asked me to bring this young man to you. He has something to say of you. Then the commander took him by the hand, went aside and asked him privately, What is it that you have to tell me? And he said, the, the Jews have agreed and asked that you bring Saul down to the council tomorrow as though they were going to inquire more fully about him. But do not yield to them for more than 40 of them lie in wait for him. Men who have bound themselves by an oath that they will neither eat nor drink till they have killed him. And now they are ready waiting for, uh, waiting for the promise from you. 
So the commander let the young man depart and commanded him, say, tell no one that you revealed this thing to me. So he called two, centurion, uh, two centurions saying, prepare 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen and go to Caesarea at the third hour of the night. And you know what happened? So here we see what God was protecting Paul. So here we see an angel comes along and delivers Peter out. Here we see Paul gets let down over the wall by a basket. And now here we see the Roman soldiers are protecting him. What's the common theme here? God wanted to protect his people. And it came three different ways. I said... What we would do is if I could see what Paul could have said to him. He said, no, the last time God, the Jews wanted to kill me, they let me down a basket in the middle of the night so I could get away. See, so many times we think we should just repeat what God has already told us. And yet the Bible says his mercies are new every morning. The The Bible tells us that God wants to speak to us, I believe, on a daily basis. And we shouldn't just think because what we heard yesterday is going to work today. Because it may not. What worked yesterday is because God said, that's what I want you to do yesterday. But he might want you and I to do something different today. Over in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Let's see what it says there in verse 14. And this is what the Lord is telling us. In Romans eight fourteen. it says, But as many are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. See, folks, we need to be led by God's Spirit. Get this, we need to be led by God's Spirit, not yesterday's procedures. Now, what's the easiest thing to do, saints? Do what you did yesterday. But the Bible says those that are led by God's Spirit are his sons and daughters. It takes work. Say that with me. It takes work. It takes work to hear God's Spirit speaking to your spirit every day. It takes work. It doesn't take much work to read rules and just blindly follow traditions. It doesn't take much work then. Isn't parenting tough? Come on. Because situations arise, don't they? Come on. And all of a sudden, if you just want to have one blanket statement here, it makes it a lot, I'm not even going to say easier, but you don't have to really find out what was the heart. You know, when our children make mistakes, they're not necessarily making mistakes because they're rebellious. Maybe they actually thought something. And so even though they made a mistake, maybe they have to be disciplined. We need to find out what was the heart of that child. And I think that's very, very important in life. Over in Matthew chapter 15, many times we just want to look at our old procedures. Matthew chapter 15, and we're going to go into verse 5, or 6, excuse me. Matthew 15, 6. It says, but uh, then he, uh, then, uh, Jesus said, but you, let's go to verse 5. But you say, whoever says to his father or mother, uh, whatever profit you might have received from me is a gift to God. Then you need not honor his father or his mother. Thus you have made the commandments of God of no effect by your what? Traditions. Are your yesterday's procedures. Well, let me tell you this. New lights though. See, God is saying we need to hear newness from God. But I, I'll tell you this. New lights don't extinguish old truths. New lights don't extinguish old truths. See, I'm not trying to tell you we're going to go off and do something crazy. We're not going to go against God's word. But what I'm saying is God's saying, you know what? He has some new lights to show us. Amen. Let me ask you this. Do you all think you have learned everything about God you're ever going to? If you do, then we might as well go take you out in the back 40 and shoot you. Hallelujah. Amen. I mean, if, if you've learned everything, you might as well go to heaven. Amen. No, see, there are new lights that God wants to show each and every one of us. The Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 3. The Apostle Paul wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. The Apostle Paul heard the voice of God speak to him in an audible way. And yet he says in Philippians 3, I have not apprehended that which I have been apprehended for, but I continue to press on towards the prize of the high calling of Christ Jesus. Paul was basically saying, I haven't learned everything yet. And if Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, could say he has not comprehended or learned everything, you know what's safe to say? We can say the same thing. Amen? 
So we need to realize that, okay? Uh, now I want to look at another objective that people in the body of Christ have a hard time with, is baptism. Baptism. What is baptism really about? Baptism is really an outward sign of an inward experience. Okay, and that's very, very important. I want us to go over to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. Let's see what it says about baptism here. In Matthew 28, 19, it says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So here we find out Jesus is telling his disciples to do what? To go and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now let's go over to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. And we're going we're gonna to start in verse 9 and 10, or, or 10, excuse me, chapter 10. So here we have the disciples, the apostles, baptizing. Here we have Ananias is getting ready to baptize Saul. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, he said, here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, arise and go in a street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he is praying. And in a vision, he had seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has the authority from the chief priest to bind up all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentile kings and children of Israel. And I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus has appeared to me on the road as you came and sent me, that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit." Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was, what? Baptized. It didn't tell me he was baptized in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It just says he was baptized. Now we're real close, so let's just turn one more page over to Acts chapter 10. This is a story about, with with, uh, Cornelius. And this was really amazing. What we don't understand, up to this point in the in, in Acts, the entire church, New Testament church, was Jewish. And now all of a sudden, so we're finding out when Pete, when Pete goes, he would remember he was at the house of Simon the Tanner. When Pete goes, Pete takes two or three extra guys with him. Because he knows there's going to be heck to pay when he gets back to Jerusalem. So he wants to make sure he has some other people that are going to testify what he did was God inspired. And we know Cornelius was a Gentile. He was a centurion of of the Italian uh, uh, brigade. And he'd been praying and fasting and wanting God to come upon his heart. And and the Lord moved upon his heart. And we're going to go down here in Acts chapter 10, verse 44. But while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon those who heard the word. And those of the circumstance who believed were astonished. Why were they astonished? Because it had only happened upon the Jews up to this time. They were astonished as many as came with Peter because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, look it, can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized? For they have received the Holy Spirit just as we are. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. And they asked him to stay a few days. How did Peter baptize these disciples? In the name of the... Lord. It wasn't in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It was in the name of the Lord. I might have told you this once, but in our little town in Flor, Indiana, we had three brethren churches. Church of the Brethren, uh, a first brethren, and one other brethren. I don't know what they were, okay? Grace Brethren. And you know what about Grace Brethren? They had the least amount of graces as anybody. They really did. Uh, they really did. But you know why these brethren churches had split off? One of the major reasons was because of baptism. Some of them thought you were supposed to dunk them backwards in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Some of them thought you were supposed to dunk them frontwards in Jesus only. Some of them in just the Father. Do you understand what I'm saying? And what I'm telling you is, what is the object of baptism? That we're telling the world that we love Jesus and we want to live for him. If you want to get dunked forward or backwards, up or down, I don't even care. Hallelujah. Do you understand what I'm saying? See, if all we're going to do is go through the ritual of baptism, it just means we might go to hell just a little bit cleaner. Hallelujah. 
See, something should be taking place on the inside. We sang that song, from the inside out. See, we get caught up with the method, and we forget about the message. I want, we, we've, we're going to do a baptism September 30. If you'd like to get baptized, we're going to do it down at, down at the river again. And you know what? I believe if you've not had a believer's baptism, I don't, I'm not saying you're not going to heaven, but I just think that's a biblical, and we talk about that. And if, you don't, if you'd like to hear about that, I know it's on the web page. okay? You can go and watch the, the teachings on baptism. But the Bible talks about, throughout the Bible, it says, he that, is, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Baptism always goes with believing. We believe in infant dedication, okay? Very important, I think, okay? See, we must never confuse the methods with the objective. If we, if we confuse the methods with the objectives, we begin to lose our effectiveness in, in, in ministering to the word of God, to this dying, crying world. I'll never forget, I heard a story about a, about a newlywed couple that got married, and it was Thanksgiving, and they got a ham, they cut the butt off the ham, and they put it in the oven to cook it, and the, and the new husband said, why did you cut the butt off the end of the ham? And the, new, and the new wife said, because my mother did. So he said, well, I'm going to call up my mom and find out why. So she called up her mom and said, mom, why did you always cut the butt in off the ham for Thanksgiving? And she said, because my mother always did. So she called up great-grandma, and she said, great-grandma, why did you cut the butt in off the end of the ham? She said, because I had a roaster once that wasn't big enough for the ham. (laughs) It made perfect sense to great-grandma, but why are we continuing to do the same method? See, you know what the objective is? I want that ham in the oven. I want to eat it. Hallelujah. Okay? And do you understand then how we lose our effectiveness that way? You know, I'm going to go real quickly here. Another objective here is raising the dead. Raising the dead. Let's look over in Luke chapter 4, or Luke chapter 11. Now we're going to go Luke chapter 7, okay? Luke chapter 7. We're going to start in verse 11. Now it happened that day that after he went into a city called Nain, that many of the disciples went with him and a large crowd. When he come near the gate of the city, behold, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a large crowd was in the city was with her. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came and touched the open coffin, and there and those who carried him stood still, and he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. So he who was dead sat up and began to speak, and he presented him to his mother. I think verse 16 is an understatement. So uh, then fear came upon all, and they glorified God, saying, a great prophet has risen up among us, and God has visited his people. What would you think if you were a pallbearer, and you're heading out to the cemetery, and Jesus comes walking by, and there is sorrow and everything, and Jesus stopped, and he goes over and he touches the dead body and says, young man, arise. I think there might be six people dying. The pallbearers might drop dead right there. Hallelujah. That would be a greater miracle than then Jesus has to raise the other six. But we find out what Jesus spoke to this man and said, young man, he touched him. And he said, arise. Okay, now let's go to John chapter 11. This is the story of Lazarus. John chapter 11, and we're going to go down in verse 41. It says, Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying and lifted up his eyes. Now, let me just do a little backwards. It tells us that Jesus came to to Lazarus' tomb four days. Everybody say four. Four days was very, very important. You got to remember, who wrote the Bible? Jewish-minded people through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. According to Jewish tradition, when someone died, their spirit hovered around their body for three days. That's Jewish tradition. And so when Jesus came on the fourth day, what was he really saying? You know what? This is not any coincidence. I don't want you to think the spirit of this man just happened to be hanging around here. No, the spirit was gone. See, that's why he came on the fourth day. Okay? And now it says, Then he took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I know that you always hear me, and because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. 
Now he said these things, and after he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with great cloths, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to him, loose him and let him go. So number one, at the first, with the widow of Nain, Jesus spoke one word and said, arise. Here we see Jesus speaking Lazarus' name, telling him to come forth. Now let's go back to 1 Kings chapter 17. Are you starting to get the idea here? See, we want to pigeonhole God into doing it our way, or he can only do it one way. And God is saying, you know what? I'm God. I created all this. Don't limit me with your mind. You know, in the book of Corinthians, and I was reading the other day in the, in the message version, God says, you know what? I have not given you this small life. If you feel hemmed in, it's because you've hemmed in yourself. God gave us freedom. Over in Luke, or in, in 1 Kings chapter 17, we're going to go down in verse 19. This is a story of Elijah. The widow had made Elijah a little room on the side. Uh, she had taken care of Elijah. Her son died. And, it says, and he said to her, give me your son. So he took him out of her arms and carried him to the upper room where he was staying and laid him on his own bed. Then he cried out to the Lord and said, oh, Lord, my God, have you also brought tragedy on this widow with whom I lodged by killing her son? And he stretched himself out on the child three times, cried out to the Lord and said, oh, Lord, my God, I pray, let this child's soul come back to him. Then the Lord heard the voice of Elijah and the soul of the child came back to him and he received him and revived him. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah says, see, your son lives. See, folks, God isn't going to break his word, but many times he will test you and I to see if we're willing to give up our opinion on a subject for his expertise. He spoke one word arise. He spoke somebody's name, and now we have Elijah laying on someone and asking for God to bring life in. What's the, what's the common denominator here? Bringing somebody back to life. I don't care how it works, okay? And the last thing I want to talk about is preaching God's word. That is our objective. Over in Philippians chapter 1, look what it says here. Philippians chapter 1. About preaching God's word. Philippians 1, and we're going to go down to verses 12 through 18. This is Paul. But I want you to know, brethren, the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all that rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren, Lord, have become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So indeed, preach Christ. Look at this. So this is crazy. Verse 15. So indeed, preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my chains, but the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospels. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in, tr in truth, Christ is preached, and in this I rejoice. What was Paul saying there? He said, you know what? Some people are preaching Christ out of the wrong motives. Out of envy and out of strife and out of selfish ambitions. And you know what Paul said? I'm just thrilled that Christ is preached. I'm just thrilled that Christ is preached. Were all these motives pure and upright? No. But, but Paul rejoiced. I believe that more churches and families and businesses and lives have become ineffective not because they've not remained true to their calling. They still have the same objective that they were maybe as an organization or a group. What has caused their decline is that people and groups are afraid to change the methods in which they present the objective. My objective here at Christ the King in Ponca, Nebraska, is to preach Christ. That's my objective. My objective is to see people give their lives to Christ, to live for him on a daily basis, to let God's abundant life be poured into their lives, that they get to experience something greater than they ever could have without Christ. That's my objective. And you know what? You're not always going to agree with me. I'm not always going to agree with you, but hallelujah. Let's preach Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen.
Let's preach Christ. Let's say, you know what? You know, we got, you know, we're all individuals. We all have our own little personal things. But we're going to lift up the name of Jesus. And you know what? If you're loving Jesus, if I'm loving Jesus, we're going to go together. Hallelujah. Now make sure you're preaching Christ or else I'm going to get on your case. Hallelujah. Okay? But let's preach Christ. Okay? I love it. You know the old saying? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. That is so wrong. That is so wrong. With an attitude like this, nothing new would ever be discovered. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Well, I tell you what, if it ain't broke, let's, fi- let's kick it and break it, hallelujah, and let's do some fixing. See, those are the churches that are still using flannel boards downstairs, okay? Well, you know what? If it ain't broke, let's not fix it. Those are the churches that still think that, you know what, maybe this or that are their personal preferences. They're still keeping on. And you know what? They're losing a dying, crying world. I tell you what, folks, I'll do anything legal and biblical to get someone to come to Jesus. My wife will tell you, when we lived in Davenport, Iowa, I bought a van to get somebody saved, a brand new van. There was a couple that started coming to our church. He was a salesman, and I wanted to win him to Christ. And I told him, I said, hey, I'm just going to go and buy a van from him. And you know what? He ended up getting saved. He ended up getting saved. You know, I had to buy a new, a new policy. Uh, I wanted to get it from Blake, but I couldn't yet, okay? So I had to get it to Stan. Stan's already saved. I want you to know that. So I want you to know that. I didn't, I didn't get my policy from Stan so I could get him saved. I realized that, Okay. But you know what, folks? I I do about anything and everything to help someone get closer to Jesus. Because that's our goal in life. You know, it says in Lamentations 3, 22 and 23, it says, great is your faithfulness. Your mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Your mercies are new every morning. Don't be, you guys know, I don't like leftovers. Leftover, I like maybe leftover chili, leftover soup. But you know what? Like I said, the other day, Marilyn, maybe a couple weeks ago, she made a meatloaf. And she couldn't wait to have a cold meatloaf sandwich on Monday going to school. I thought, forget it, man. I'm going to eat an extra piece of hot meatloaf on Sunday so I don't have to eat it cold on Monday. Hallelujah. <laughs> That's me. I don't like leftovers. And you know what I found out? God says we don't have to have leftovers with him. His mercies are new. You don't have to try to stockpile all of his mercies and all his blessings. Say, you know, this is just in case maybe God doesn't do anything for me tomorrow. I'm telling you what, he knows where you're at. He knows your heart. He wants to bless you. That's our God. He is El Shaddai. He is always more than enough. Uh, One of my favorite pastors is Jack Hayford. And he said it best. He said, I may adopt a style to reach my culture, but it will be the spirit, not my style, that penetrates their hearts. It's God's spirit. Let's keep our objectives etched in stone. Let's keep our objectives etched in stone. Salvation, healing, spirit baptism, soon coming king, heal all these things. Let's keep those things etched in stone. May the methods we use to achieve our objectives be like clay in the potter's hand, ready to change. Those methods... We can change them. You heard me say last week, sacred cows make holy hamburgers. Sacred cows make holy hamburgers. God brought Marilyn and I here to the greater Ponca area to help people get closer to Jesus. That's what my passion is. It really is. I, I just love to hear stories about how people are growing with the Lord. That's what I want for you. I, you know, we don't understand how much God loves us. We don't understand how we have a heavenly father that wants only the best for us. If we'll just listen to him and obey him. And you know what? Remember when you were a kid coming, uh, growing up and your dad said, hey, just trust me. You know, just trust me. It's going to be okay. So what would you do? You trust him. Because dad knew something you didn't know. Well, you know what? Heavenly Father knows a lot of things we don't know. You know what he's telling us this morning? Trust me. Trust me. Maybe with your children. Maybe you're having a tough time with your kids. You know what God's saying? Maybe you have to change the method a little different with them. Amen? You know, some kids, maybe maybe spanking some kids doesn't help a lot. It sure did with ours, okay? But maybe for some it doesn't. 
Sure did with me, okay, hallelujah, okay? But maybe it doesn't. So you know what you do? You find out what your kid likes the most. And if they're not going to be obedient, that's what you get take away from them. We have a granddaughter, Charlotte. I tell you what, Donnie will tell you, we can spank her and she's just as defiant as ever. But you, she finds out what she likes. You know what she hates? She'll cry her eyes out. If you put her in the timeout corner, she'll cry her eyes out. Find something. Do you understand? Because you know what? Just because it worked for one doesn't mean it's going to work for them all. And so what does that mean? It takes us time to get to know our children. It takes us time to get to know what God wants for that child and then treat them individually. Remember, let's just not say one swoop of the paintbrush covers it all. They're all different, unique gifts from God that we need to help. Amen? And we can do it. That's why, you know what? How God treats you, how God treats me, it's all different. Some of us understand things differently, and that's okay. See, God's not a one-size-fits-all God. He says, I'm going to treat you on an individual basis. I know what's best for you. And what's best for you may not be best for you. So God will make it different for each of us. Amen? Why don't we stand up, please? Lord, we do thank you and we praise you. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed and our hearts open to you. As we sang that song this morning, the reckless love of God, Lord, you loved us so much that you sent your only son, Jesus, to die on the cross for us. If there's somebody here this morning say, Pastor Jeff, I never made that decision for Jesus. Maybe I've gone to church. Maybe I haven't. I don't know. But, uh, you know, if the Holy Spirit is working on your heart, to your spirit, and saying, you know what? It's time today. Today's the day to make a decision for Christ. Today's the day you're going to say, you know what? I'm going to take off the mask and I'm going to live for him. Today's the day where I draw a line in the sand. I said, you know what? Flesh, the world, and the devil, I'm, I'm done. I'm done. I'm walking on the other side. I'm going to live for Jesus. Does that mean you and I will be perfect? No, but it means that when you and I make a mistake, when we are weak, then the Bible says truly he is strong. That's you with no one look around. Is there anybody lift their hand up and say, Pastor Jeff, you pray for me right where I'm at. I'd love to pray for you right where you're at. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I thank and I praise you for this group of people today. We are more than conquerors, Lord Jesus. We are more than conquerors. When I look out over this congregation, Lord God, I see victors, not victims. Lord, when I look out over this congregation, Lord God, I see the light of the world and the salt of the earth. Lord, when I look over this congregation, I see people going under or going over and not under. I see people blessed coming in and people blessed going out. That's what I see when I see this group of people, Lord. And I thank you and I praise you, Lord God. We are making a difference in our, in our own marriages, in our own families, where we work, where we play, Lord God, in our homes, Lord God, in this church, Lord, in our communities, Lord God. We're making a difference because of what Jesus is doing for us. He's working on us from the inside out. In Jesus' precious name, amen.